Hello friends, my name is AJ and welcome to another in-depth review video for AP Computer Science. Today we are going to be doing an in-depth review for Unit 8, which is 2D Arrays. Now Unit 8 of course was not covered on the 2020 AP Computer Science exam, which is why I'm going, it, going over it after the exam. I wanted to go over all of the exam materials and the things very important for your exam review prior to the exam, which was on Friday, and now we'll be finishing up with Units 8, 9 and 10. Of course, if you're taking the exam after 2020, you will likely have these on your exam. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, everyone. So today we're looking at unit eight, which is on two dimensional arrays. And the first question is, of course, what is a two dimensional array? Well, a two dimensional array is an array with two dimensions. Now, of course, that kind of sounds redundant, so let, let's kind of explore what this means, right? The best way to think about a two-dimensional array is that it represents a table. It represents a table, right? So I have this table over here. It has four rows and three columns, okay? And we have rows, which are down here. Now, of course, you know, it's sometimes it's a little bit confusing, right? Because when you're looking at vertical directions, you know, you're talking about columns, but of course, this is where we would number all of our rows because it is on um, it is on this side. So if we put a number here, it refers to this entire row. If we put a number here, it refers to this entire row. And we can do the same for columns, right? You want to put your column labels usually on the top of your table over here going downward. So I want to think about what do I want to actually label my rows and columns in this particular example of a table with uh, four rows and three columns. Well, if I think about how do I um, refer to the actual elements inside of arrays, or for that matter, how do I refer to the characters inside of a string? Well, we usually start or we usually call these indexes, indexes. And we always start counting with indexes with the number zero instead of the number one, if you remember. So if I want to talk about my rows, my first row would be row zero. My second row would be row one. My third row would be row two. And my fourth row would be uh, the row at index three. Now we can go to columns. The first column will be at index 0. The second column would be at index 1. The third column would be at index 2 and so on. So this would go onwards in rows. This would go onwards in columns, right? Now, if we think about a one-dimensional array, right, or a normal array that we did in unit 6 two units ago, what does an array represent? Well, if you look on this particular uh, table, an array would just represent what would be one row inside of my table, right? Because I can store elements inside of this row. And so that is essentially the difference between a one-dimensional and a two-dimensional array. A one-dimensional array is just, it goes um, one way and you have elements inside of that one array, which go in you know, straight across, but then in a two-dimensional array, you have multiple rows like this and multiple different columns, which of course represent each individual element. So I'm going to go in a little bit more detail now, and I'm going to show you how you actually create a two-dimensional array and basically like a table, right? So you can see this code down here to create a two-dimensional array, and let's break this down. So the first thing that is in the uh, beginning of our line is going to be the type, the type of array that we want to create over here, the type. Then you notice here we have two, two sets of brackets. And this is very interesting because if you, if you remember with a normal array, you only have one set of brackets when you're creating a one dimensional array or a normal array from unit six. Now, because we're creating a two dimensional array, you now have two brackets instead on this side here. And then over here, 
Next to our two brackets, just like with a normal array, you have your name of the variable. The name of the variable or the two-dimensional array that you are creating. And that, of course, goes to the right of, that goes to the right of the actual, um, this part over here with the type and the two sets of brackets. Then further to the right, after the name of the variable, you have your assignment operator. Your assign mint operator right here and actually I'll just cut this off to a side so that it, I can fit what's next and the assignment operator of course is the equal sign so if you remember as always everything to the right of the assignment operator is assigned to what is to the left of the assignment operator so then following the assignment operator just like when we created normal arrays from unit 6 you have to have the new keyword and the new keyword is used to represent the new array that you're creating. Then over here, you again now specify what you want to create. And this is going to be the type, which is array. And then you notice here, you again have your brackets. Just like this, you have again four of them or two sets rather than just one set of an open and closing bracket. Now, if you remember, this again looks very similar to creating an array or a, or a one-dimensional array from unit six. You have your new, your type of your um, actual array that you're trying to create. Then you have brackets. And usually what you do inside of the brackets of a normal array is you put the length of the array that you want to create. But in this case, we actually have two different brackets. So what do we want to do here? Well, the first bracket, the number that goes inside of the first bracket represents the number of rows, the number of rows inside of the two dimensional array. And the second number over here represents the number of columns inside of my array, the number of columns inside of my array. And it looks like my, my tablet's frozen here. So let me just go back in and there we go. Okay, so you can see here that I have the number of rows and the number of columns, and that is put in, and it will basically create then a blank two-dimensional array with the number of rows specified and the number of columns specified. Now remember, when we are doing normal arrays and you created these blank arrays from unit six, right? Let's say you were working with an integer array. You still, those same default values that were set, it was set uh, default when you created arrays still apply to two-dimensional arrays. So what I mean by that is let's say I'm creating a two-dimensional integer array, then the default value for all of my um, elements inside of my two-dimensional array when it's created like this would be zero, right? For booleans, it would be false. For strings, it would just be empty string and doubles would be 0, 0.0. So those are kind of the default values for the actual um, elements that go inside of your array or your two dimensional array in this case. And now this brings me to something uh, very important when I am talking about the, uh, the kind of the structure of two dimensional arrays. And you notice here again, I did rows first and then columns second. This is actually a little bit important. So I want to say here that two dimensional arrays are structured in row major order, row major order, rows first, columns second. And what does this mean? This basically means that columns are stored in rows. Columns are actually stored in rows. So what do I mean by this? Well, you can see down here that looks like this is frozen again. All right, there we go. I don't know what's going on today. So over here, right, I have one outer array which stores all of my rows. My outer array here, so outer array stores rows. Just like that, and you can see, for example, that this is an entire row and it stores all three of this all three of these rows in that outer array. And then the inner array over here, whoops. The inner arrays actually represent and store the columns. And what do I mean? Well, 
if I look at each individual row inside of my you know, overall bigger array, each individual element technically represents its own column, right? This element represents the first column, this element represents the second column, and this element represents the third column. And this, of course, would be the same for all of these, right? And for every single row. So every single row, for example, every single row's first element will represent the first column. And that's what, when stacked on each other like this, it actually creates that main overall column. And the entire purpose of the row major order basically talks about what you're accessing first, right? So like when I do this, or when I'm actually accessing values or creating values, the first thing I do is I look at my rows first. Then after that, I look at the column. The column is inside of the row, right? It's not the opposite way where rows are inside of columns, where you access the column first, then you access the row in that column, right? It is that you access the row first, and then you look for the column second. And that's all row major order means. Now there is something called column major order, but Java does not use that. So now let's take a look at actually accessing elements inside of our uh, two-dimensional array. So you can see here, I have this system.out.print line, and then inside of my print statement, I have var name bracket zero bracket one. So the first thing that is here is going to be the name of your array, your array name. That of course you want to get a value out of. Then over here you can see I have my brackets again. I have my brackets. Looks like my thing is stuck again, so I'll have to figure that out why it keeps getting stuck like this. And then in here I have my row index. And then here I have my column index. So what this means is that in order to access, for example, the first element um, in my two dimensional array or column uh, or the first row, first column, I would want to put in zero, zero because I want to use the indexes. If you remember, again, I'm going to have to close out, reopen. If you go up here, right, I refer to my first row or all of my rows indexes start at zero, just like the normal arrays. So to access first row, first column, I'd have to look at the first row across like this and then the first column and that will access my value right over here. So that is why, again, it, it, this is the same with, um, with strings and with arrays where the first um, element or the first you know character for the strings case is located at index zero, okay? So the first element in the array is at index position zero. Now I wanna talk about this. What if I just use my variable name and then one single bracket with a number? And what this actually does is this accesses the entire row. So for example, I go back to my thing here. If I were to put array, uh, one, for example, it's going to take and return this entire row, the entire first row. And it's going to actually take that first row as an array, a one dimensional array. Because now I'm, I'm taking only one entire, um, one entire row. I'm taking one entire row out of my normal two dimensional array. So then it just becomes a one dimensional array. Okay. And then the last thing here, I just wanted to again mention, and this is very similar with arrays and everything else. In order to edit the elements, you simply, again, use your name, you, you put the um, index of the row and column you wanna edit, and then you use the assignment operator and you put in your new value. This shouldn't look very different at all from normal arrays. You're just applying your new two-dimensional array knowledge back into this uh, scenario, okay? And then the last thing I want to talk about is actually traversing two-dimensional arrays. And what do I mean by traversing two-dimensional arrays? Well, traversing is, again, looking through the elements of. So I'm looking through all of the elements of my two-dimensional array. And the way I do this is I'm trying to look, and I want to uh, point to this example again with my, with my uh, table because it's the easiest to, um, to visually see and to kind of re represent. I want to look from this element, my first element, over to finish my row, 
Then I go row by row all the way to the end. So I'm going to be referring to this as traversing it from the top left to bottom right. And I just wanted to clarify what I mean by that. And that's simply, again, going from the first element, finishing the row, and then going through all subsequent rows to the last value of the of the two-dimensional array, the two, last element inside of the two-dimensional array. So down here, I have a nested for loop. And the reason why I'm going to need a nested for loop rather than just a normal for loop is because I need one for loop to actually go through all of my rows and then I need a second for loop to go through all my columns. If you remember using, you know, with a normal array, you only have to use one for loop to traverse a normal array. And that is again because you only have, you know, one dimension to look through. In this case, I have two. So I need to first look through all of my rows which is what my first um, uh, my first for loop does. You could see R is set to zero, and then you do um, R to array dot length, and you do, do R plus plus. And then over here, and actually there's a little bit of a problem. I need to change this to array zero dot length. Okay, so then here I have a for loop, an inner for loop for my columns. And you can see here that instead of actually doing it from, instead of doing it from the um, first element to the end of the row or to the length of my array, when I do array.length, I'm actually referring to how many rows there are. But when I do array zero dot length, I actually refer to how many columns there are. So I'm actually going to write that down. Array.length refers to the number of rows. But then array zero dot length refers to the number of columns, just like that. And then I have my for loop, and then I have my, of course, my print statement in which I put R and C in its respective position, R for rows, C for columns. So again, here I am traversing my array. I'm traversing my array from top left to bottom right. And then lastly, down at the bottom, and this is stuck again. I don't know why it keeps getting stuck today. Maybe a, a, it may be a new bug in the actual version of this app. I'm going to try to figure out why it, why it continues to do that. Down here, you can see that I have a different type of way to do it. And, and it's still traversing it from the top left to the bottom right. But this time I'm using my for each loops, also sometimes called enhanced for each loops or enhanced for loops. So what I do here is I am trying to get one element out of my array. And the element I actually get out of my outer loop is the entire row. And remember, the row is going to be stored as an array rather than a specific value. So now that I have my row inside of an array, I can then do another for loop to get each value outside of my row, and then I can simply print out the value. So again here, this is going to use for each loops rather than for loops. And you can see this is a little bit more concise in the way it's written. It may be a little bit easier to read for some also. And uh, it is pretty, it's pretty useful to be able to use um, and because, you know, for each loops, always people like them because you don't have to deal with bounds and stuff. It just looks through. And so in this case, you will avoid bound errors when trying to traverse arrays. All right, everyone, that is it for the two dimensional array in depth review. And in part two, I'm going to be going over the practice test, which is in the description below. I made the practice test. There are 10 multiple choice questions and then a FRQ to help you get prepared for maybe an in-class test or even an AP exam for um, the topic of two-dimensional arrays. So definitely I, uh, go into the comment section and check it out, download it, and try it for yourself. There's also an optional timer um, kind of provided or a guideline of maybe how many minutes you should do um, in each section. And also in addition to this practice test, the notes that I write on my screen here will also be in the description below for you to download. So if you uh, do the practice tests, definitely check out part two to, and, and I'll go over all of the answers for it and also an explanation for the answers. If you'd like the video, feel free to like and subscribe for more content. And as always, thanks for watching.